Hello and welcome to the Unschool Carpool. I'm Heather Young and what you will be hearing today is a discussion I've had with my kids a few months ago while we were on a trip to Pittsburgh and it all about what it was like transitioning to unschooling, what unschooling was like, and it's a really fun conversation and I hope you'll enjoy it. And it is before I got a new microphone so the sound quality is pretty bad. Just a heads up there, but enjoy. So instead of driving to work today, I'm driving to Pittsburgh. I've got all the kids with me, except my youngest. And I want to ask them what it is like, what it was like to transition to unschooling. What did it feel like? What did they notice? What didn't they notice? Because a lot of people ask, did you tell your kids? Didn't you tell your kids? How did you handle the transition? So I did not straight up let them know. I gradually stopped doing things and stopped complaining about things and stopped telling them to do work. And so I'm gonna ask them their perspective. We've got with us Bay, Peter, and Mindy. Some of them are my kids, some of them aren't, all in school. So, Bay, what do you remember about our process of beginning unschooling where I just stopped giving you schoolwork? I remember correctly, mostly it was, I kind of, I felt guilty that I wasn't, like, reminding you. Like, I noticed that we weren't doing homework, and I felt like you must be just forgetting. And I must be getting out of this somehow. Like, when I conveniently forgot to mention it was bedtime. <laughs> so I had these, like, months to be, like, how long is this going to go on? Do I, get to, do I get away with this? Should I tell her? Does she know? <laughs> because, you know, nine-year-olds. Yeah. It's, no concept of time. I... I this could have been two weeks or six months for all I know that I thought this because the concept of time is shattered. Yeah. So basically I just felt like I needed to tattle <laughs> on you for not doing it, for not giving us our homework. And eventually I, I, I felt like if I was going to do this, I might as well do it right. So I actually hid my homework books. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, if, if she's not going to think we need to do homework, maybe I could just get the, push it out of the mind entirely. So I hid my geography book back in the back of the laundry room, put my math homework in the bonfire at one point. I was oh, a weird little kid. kid. Yeah, I do. yeah. We also burned some curriculum that was given to us. I think I buried one in my brother's garden because I didn't want it to affect my garden because we were all supposed to be growing these gardens. Yeah. Like these box design? gardens. Yeah, that and, would make sense. And I dug up his garden so I could bury my, um, it was a uh, English homework. Yeah. And I buried it and then I put the flowers back on top, but I don't think the roots took through the thick I would think not. But and my flowers were, looked good in comparison. And you were sneaky. You were so sneaky. <laughs> uh, Peter, what do you remember? Uh, not much. Yeah. Um, I don't Because actually, you're so observant. I don't actually, I remember vaguely, I had just started being at the age where you started giving me homework books when this was like a day. So I was getting them and I didn't like it and then I stopped getting them and I didn't care. Yeah, I do remember that's... playing a lot of online learning flash games. Yeah, I do remember that. But Those you know, that's games. that's about the time you taught yourself to read though. Yeah, it's also the time I, about the time I taught myself how to close the right click that was yeah. a big Yeah, that was a big I stage. Did Left handed, learning to use a mouse, that's a really big deal. Anyway, Mindy, oh. what do you remember? Because um, you were older. Yeah, and I transitioned from public school, not home. Well, we did a little bit of unschooling in between, but it was basically unschooling with books to make my dad happy. That's right. Yeah, because he wanted, like, science, wasn't it? He wanted us to keep up with the work and, you know, yeah. still be doing actual schooling because he wasn't sure about things, so... Yeah, he, would... he had a lot of patience with that whole wanting to jump into unschooling fully. Yeah. I know we did a lot of homeschool. We had, like, a homeschool group in La Vista that we did that was, you know... We had all these friends that were, you know, boycotting the school systems and... Oh, and man, everything. I remember that. Uh, we went to lots of homeschool functions, but eventually my dad gave up on getting us to do books and homework and things and just kind of left it. So we stopped using a whole lot of, you know, and my mom would do like, she ordered like, you know, fifth time me, you 
Texas math books and Texas history books that we went through. You know, oh, I remember the Texas books. history thing. She said that, well, they have to know Texas history. You taught like, me a lot of that. I actually enjoy those. I like remember you, the you, like, you were the kid that got out the president's book. I did. I checked out a book. Bigger than my fist at the time. Like, it was bigger oh, yeah, than my yeah. fist. It was huge. It was a coffee table book. I wasn't actually allowed to check this out. I was only allowed to because I was a precocious. Eight, I was an eight year old kid asking to check out this book that was basically, before I was really on the internet, it was Wikipedia for the presidents yeah. in book form. Yeah. It was, it wasn't stories about the presidents. It was. When they died, when they lived, when they Fact. when they passed these different laws. Yeah. It was really boring. It, it was, was boring. really boring. It was so dumb. <laughs> I read it cover to cover. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Um, okay. So what do you remember about the transition from just educational unschooling to radical unschooling? It was a very gradual process, but I want to know, do you remember it being a gradual process? Because we didn't just like give up bedtimes and everything all at once. It was like I started giving up little things. Like it's like I said, it started with me saying, "Okay, I'm going to stop nagging," and that was really about me and not about the kids at all. That was I needed to stop nagging and I wanted to become the fun mom and not the nag. And I was just I was the enforcer and the nag, and there was an awful lot of yelling. So, what do you guys remember? I remember the first time I was allowed up past my bedtime. Oh, do you? I do. Because, okay, um, there had been a really, really big fight in the house lately because I wanted to play Harvest Moon. Oh, yeah. And Peter wanted to play Harvest Moon. Yeah. And we couldn't play at the same time because it was on the week. Yeah. And you let me stay up past Peter's bedtime. You put Peter and I to bed. Right. But you let me stay up until 2 in the morning every night if I wanted to play Harvest Moon. Peter got it during the day. I wasn't allowed to play it while Peter was awake. Yeah. But if they were asleep, I could sit and play Harvest Moon. And that time got kind of pushed. Oh, like, yeah. It yeah. started, it, I could play till 11, and then it yeah. was 12, then 1. And eventually, it just like got thrown to the wind. Oh, you can stay up for whatever you want. Well, and it actually helped you a lot that your dad. Um, oh, yeah. Seamus does not stick to a sleep schedule. He's not 24 circadian rhythm. And so his, his sleep cycles throughout the year, and we can kind of predict when he's going to be sleeping at certain times of the year, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very squishy when he's going to be asleep. So a lot of times he's up during the night, especially if he's programming or writing a lot. And and, and Peter also has non circadian And it's me. Yeah, it's you. And so it was, it had a lot of insomnia. And so it was actually a really easy transition once I got over the whole yeah, this is stupid. I need to stop doing this because why am I yelling at the kids for, you know, not sleeping at a certain time when their dads wake all hours? Okay, so go ahead. Funny thing is, yeah. Okay, I I, I had insomnia all throughout my childhood. Oh yeah, really yeah. really bad. Like I could not sleep. I'd be yeah. up until four in the morning, five in the morning. I I would sometimes just sleep one hour. Yeah. Like this was just what my life was. So this was pretty much up until the time you let me start yeah. getting up at, at different times. And I would start going to sleep at two and then three and I got the desocialization time I needed. Yeah. And I got to be up doing things during my insomniac hours. Yeah. And the Which is how is, adults handle it. Exactly. It made no sense. I was stuck in bed all night. I, I had night terrors. I was stuck Absolutely. in bed when I couldn't do anything in the dark. I wasn't allowed to talk to Peter. Yeah. I wasn't allowed to listen to audiobooks loudly. So yeah. And if it woke Peter up, then I'd get in trouble, so I couldn't really do anything. I couldn't have a light on, so I couldn't read. Yeah. And I couldn't really read really well anyway, because of the dyslexia. Yeah. I had really bad dyslexia. So, yeah. basically, these hours were, like, the worst. Which would contribute to your daylight, the yeah. stress during the day. So, um, go ahead. Uh, I got to stay up later and later, and eventually, I kind of evened out. Like, mm -hmm. I don't actually have the sleep schedule problem of Peter and my dad. I can get up at normal hours. I can sleep at normal hours now. Like, this was a childhood yeah. thing that pretty much stopped once I was able to get up and go to sleep as I pleased. Exactly. Peter, what do you remember about the transition to radical unschooling? Uh, probably not much. <laughs> <laughs> right around the time I got the little baby computer. 
Yes. Yeah. And I remember being a child and staying up till all hours playing online flash games. Yeah, but you Most also... Most of my experience in flash games. It's all I really remember. But you also had massive insomnia from, oh, yeah, was, as a baby even, you just wouldn't sleep. It and wasn't nearly as bad at as days I did manage to get to sleep if you forced me. Yeah. Especially with the audiobooks. Force sounds a little harsh. That sounds yeah. like someone knocked I you over. I sat on you. Nobody sat no, on you. I promise. No, it's just people would come in and make sure I was still in bed. And, yeah. And so. I used to tell you the floor was lava. Do you remember that? Yeah, it didn't really It didn't work. work. Glue? No. The bench bed was glue. No, the it few didn't times, work. The few times you guys caught me out of bed for well, though. Yeah, yeah uh, that was you I did not started. like getting in trouble. You obey, would fight me tooth and nail, and you were traumatized by getting in trouble. Yeah, you guys were scary when I was small. Yeah, you were very big, and you both had very loud voices. Loud voices, and I came from a shouting family. And my grandmother was even worse. My mom always said, "Oh, you're not nearly as bad as I was, and you're not nearly as bad as your grandmother was," because she was a screamer. But once we moved to Catacombs, schooling Really, for the most part, there's not a lot of yelling in our house, would you say? It's... I mean, what was the last time? I mean, other than whenever I'm, like, super emotional and I have a lot of jobs going on and I'm really tired, <laughs> then I fall apart at Dirty Dishes, and that's my downfall. But other than that, it, it's much calmer. Oh, yeah. Um, Mindy, yeah. what do you remember about your transition to radical unschooling? Because, you know, I know your dad was not on board. And your mom was like, I want to embrace it completely. What do you remember? Yeah, there was a lot of, you know, my dad was still working. He was a farmer at that time. So, you know, there was a lot of, my dad was out of the house so much that for the most part, we switched to unschooling pretty quickly. But we still pretended a little my dad's sake that we, you know, oh yeah, we totally picked up the textbooks today. Look at the, the five paragraphs we read on here. <laughs> I, I, I remember, yeah. um, Specifically, I would I fought for um, not having a bedtime anymore, and I never really, you know, once I was older and had you know school stuff, I didn't have a bedtime. You know, as long as my homework was done, then I could stay up on the computer. But my parents would come in and remind me, "You probably want to go to bed soon. You probably want to sleep soon. You have school in the morning." Yeah, yeah. But I really wanted to stay up and talk to Meg yeah. because you know I didn't have school anymore. And she got to stay up late and didn't have a bedtime. Yeah, and it really gets to this point where you're like, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? I had to fight and argue yeah. and, and reason with my parents. It was the only time that I remember, you know, having to like make up and reason with them and, you know, give logical excuses for why this yeah. should happen. Yeah. But I fought for not having a bedtime anymore so that I could talk to Bay. Yeah. And my dad was still very, you know, all right, but I'm still going to remind you when it seems like you're not getting enough sleep. Yeah, I remember some of that because, you know, I was talking to your mom a lot at the time. It is. It, it's funny because the things that we as adults, the parents, stress about when you're thinking about the process and what what's going to happen if... Do you guys remember being on the computer all the time? I know that Peter does. <laughs> because that's all Peter remembers. Pretty much about childhood, that's pretty much all Peter remembers. It was the thing that made a lasting impression on me. Yeah. It's what I cared about. And, well, and your dad's the same way. You know what was really funny? What? You got us those little laptops. Yeah. It was like notebook thing. Yeah, the little tiny, cute little EPCs. Yeah. That kind of... I never great. really used them to play games. Yeah. Um, what I actually did was... I mean, they were technically games, but it wasn't what I used them for. <laughs> I would open up a dressed-up game. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of where I learned to storytell. Mm -hmm. I would pick a dress-up game with a broad, wide range of outfits and tell a story and go through the outfits, what this character would wear for different times, yeah. so I could put a visual to my storytelling. Yeah, because I couldn't actually physically write yet because of dyslexia. It, it gave me a way to get that creative creativity out. Because when I had, say, the typewriter, yeah. I had a really hard time because I couldn't spell a lot of words. I had to keep a little dictionary on hand. It was very yeah. frustrating. So it gave me a creative outlet for my storytelling where I didn't actually have to write anything yet. And, and I got to writing later. Of course, I'm literate now. Yeah. But clearly. Wow. And, you know, you're working on several books. So, yeah, yeah you clearly can't write. And the dyslexia is no longer a huge issue in your life. But that kind of gave me a jump in point. Yeah. Where I could actually see what I wanted to do. And I... I 
once I realized that I enjoyed storytelling enough, that's what got me to eventually want to learn to write. Yes. Because before that, it, how would I know I enjoyed this? It, it, it seems complicated. There are a lot of symbols involved. It, exactly. And there were a lot of symbols. There's a lot that was hard for you. Um, what about you guys grew up with food allergies, and that was a really big deal. And so food was a real struggle, and it was a really hard thing for me to let go of because I knew how detrimental it was to your health at the time, which you've grown out of almost all of them. Yeah. Of that was a really hard thing, and it was really scary because the allergic reactions were the sort that could kill you. Yeah. And so that was a really scary, scary thing, but I had to let go because I knew you were going to be moving out as soon as you physically could because I know you. And you wanted to be about since you were six. Oh, uh, six? Wow, I was behind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember you were ready. You were like, I'm going to move out as soon as I turn this age. And I was like, you know, you can't actually do that. You have to be this age. And you'd be like, well, I'm going to move out as soon as I turn that age. What do you remember about the transition to taking over your own health and your own foods that you could eat? One of the main problems with me was, okay, I was a social little kid. Oh, yeah. And between the homeschooling and the food allergies, it, it meant I, I was weird. I was very weird. <laughs> I had uh, epilepsy as a child. I couldn't look at TV screens. Mm -hmm. I couldn't eat all the foods the other kids ate. I was homeschooled, so I didn't have a lot of social environments. And when I did get put in social environments, it was all food. Always about the food. They're all. It just is. And, and that was a very is. clear separation. Yeah. You could very much tell me from the other kids that was very difficult. So taking control of my own diet was very important to me. Oh, absolutely. It, it, I wanted to be in control. I've always wanted to be independent. It's wanting to move out. So getting to be in charge of my own food, at least once I realized my own food allergies and actually realized what they were, it was more about control and I, I, I felt like I could control it because once you let go mm -hmm. it was no longer somebody else telling me what i could and could not do it was me realizing what i could and could absolutely and, and then you were able to discover what was actually i had didn't have the time and energy to pick all the specific i actually were worked out what to, i had because um it was too hard because all three of you had food allergies as a little kid i had a whole lot of food allergies and i have a syndrome now as an adult that causes me to be allergic to uh, raw fruits and vegetables. So I would periodically get these allergic reactions that we couldn't figure out where they were coming from because a fruit or a vegetable wasn't cooked enough. And, we, and this it was, was very easy to blame it on something else. And this was the height of the raw food I know. thing. <laughs> like, Everything was raw. <laughs> the big trend is, you know, you have the raw <laughs> carrot juice and the raw celery and all. Uh, you, you need everything to be absolutely raw and i am so allergic that it, it can cause my throat to swell up it, it can be a really big problem for me so everybody kept giving one of the big things is when i was a little kid the only thing i could eat at a party was a vegetable plate yep because i was allergic to pretty much everything under the sun yeah so as an adult people kept giving me vegetable plates <laughs> And I kept getting sick. I had to keep Benadryl in my bag because I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. It was blamed on the smells of the other food. Like, oh, I ate the vegetable plate, but that clearly can't be it. Who's allergic to that? So uh, I guess it's the smell of the turkey that's in the oven. Yeah, that must be it. It yeah. was very confusing. Yeah. So, Although, granted, your dad actually is allergic yes. to the turkey in the oven, even if he's not eating it. So, you know, that wasn't too far mm -hmm. off as a guess. But as an adult, taking control of my own diet, I was actually to real, able to realize what I was actually allergic to yes. and pinpoint it and work it down. And now I don't have allergic reactions because I cook my food. Yeah. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> cook your food! Peter, what do you remember, if anything, about being more free with your microwave burritos? <laughs> <laughs> and mac and cheese. And macaroni and cheese. Yeah. And, and ramen. And ramen. Yeah. You <laughs> don't eat that. I eat garbage. <laughs> then again, I'm drinking Mountain Dew and yeah, I'm craving the, Cheetos. Who says the girl who oh, is and drinking Cheetos. Diet Mountain Cheetos Dew and, and craving Cheetos? I live on Diet Mountain Dew. Don't judge me. I'm, I'm not eating. judging mm -hmm. at all. Uh, yes. no, That's her no, judging no, face. No, you can't see it, but it's her judging face. Yeah. It's judging face? Me. Oh. Mindy. Yeah. What? You know, I don't know how strict you were in your house. Not strict enough, probably. My family was different. I mean, between your family and my family, yeah. we kind of appear like two opposites food-wise. Of course, we're from the South. Yeah. And you have to love food. 
food and eat food if you're from the south. It's a law. Yeah, your your family's diet is very very different, and it does like what they carry the stores down there and everything is very different than what was here when we went to visit. So yeah, I I can see that. You know, if, I was just realizing how very healthy it was for us to kind of have this little exchange program. <laughs> yeah, really. I think that was an excellent experience. I, I almost think that should be more unschooler. Uh, I would love to do that. And I would love to, you know, and your dad would too. We would love to provide a place for people to, okay, my kid's a teen and I, they're they're kind of chomping at the bit to get they out, get they're out. not ready. I almost wish that had been a real thing like that I could have gone and done. Yeah. Kind of, I could have gone and done because it, it was really healthy for you to get to see other food habits and me to get to see other food habits and everything else. We got to see different learning systems. Just different t- culture. Different mm-hmm. culture altogether. I mean, America's basically so big that Texas and Pennsylvania are very different. They're, very, they're different countries. Very different. And yeah, oh, I would love to see a, a an exchange program. In fact, um, several of us have talked about it before. That was where, probably the healthiest thing for me to go and do. Well, at, I, it's one of the real benefits of going off to college, frankly. Uh-huh. Whenever people go off to college, that's what they do. And of course, it's a bit of a culture shock, but it can be very helpful for you to finally be able to see different ways of interaction, different ways of lifestyle that yeah. different people have dealt with. And, you know, in high school, you do, like, exchange programs with other countries. And honestly, even just going across the country or going going and traveling, this actually should be a separate podcast, so maybe we'll divide this up. But they traveled across the country by bus at age 15 and Mm -hmm. that was an amazing experience for all of us even though she never responded (coughs) never calls home it's been it's been five years let it go no i don't wanna um my phone died at a stop okay it was an issue it's it's been fixed i have a phone now she was fine i was it was an excellent excellent experience and now peter's about to go and on it's a, a similar type of experience and I, I, it really is i think an important part of the unschooling life is to get to travel and to and obviously not everything is for everybody but it is such a benefit and especially with our two families being so close already yeah it was a really easy it, it was like there's this opportunity here you know we, yeah we have this that we can do and it is, and it's, you know, even though we're very close families, living in the other person's house is very different. And you're in the other state and everything, and it's just such a different world. Not being able to get the foods you're used to eating. Mm-hmm. That was a big shock for me, because my family up here eats fancy cheeses on a regular <laughs> basis that's like your favorite food group oh yes cheese all cheese. the cheese we get fancy butter we get fancy cheeses i go down there and it's potatoes and pasta which my family didn't eat when i left yeah, we were no gluten at all family I so i went can't. down there you, you don't eat starch basically no i can't eat starch so i went down there and it was all starch and it was a very different food group it actually it's helped me delicious. It actually helped me even out my diet. Yeah. Because going one or the other wasn't it was particularly healthy for, for you. Me. Um, me as a person, I needed variety. Yeah. And I kind of need the best of both worlds, which I can do now. Well, and I've got to say, like, my own experience with going to Poland when I was in college really opened up my eyes. But link really helped, I'd say, the self confidence. Oh, yeah. Um, I know for me, recognizing that I was able to do something. My dad is a scaredy cat. I love my dad. He was terrified of me going to pull. Um, he was sure something was going to happen. And I mean, something did happen. Something did happen. I lost my passport. I lost all my money. I left everything in a taxi. No, she's alive. I'm alive. Yeah, I totally did kind of like, if you've ever seen French Kiss, yeah, I left all my stuff in the taxi, had spent days at the console. Um, but I survived. And... It, once I recognized, hey, I can get through this, then it was really easy to recognize I can handle other stuff and I'll survive and nobody kidnapped me and nobody tried to murder me and nothing happened and I was fine. And that was Bay's experience as well. Oh, you know, yeah. Traveling. I mean, okay, I traveled Greyhound. I, I didn't go to another country, <laughs> but basically it's Greyhound basically is another, another country. country. I mean, a lot of very scary stuff happens when you are 
15 and you don't understand a lot and you're from a kind of sheltered environment. Well, and yeah, we live in a tiny town. Honestly, the stories she tells are all my... I, don't I, I scare just... them off, dude. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, all the stories I tell, they were all completely harmless. It was me being a dick. Yeah. It, it was... It was mistakes made. It wasn't even mistakes made. It was me not understanding what was going on. Like, uh, the first time I ever got panhandled. Oh, yeah, That was yeah. terrifying. What's going on? What's happening? Why are you asking me for money? I come from a tiny town. We don't have homeless. Or yeah, if they do, we... they decide to very, very politely live under bridges. Because no, I don't we understand. Don't have homeless. They, they, we have a very good system in place for the homeless. And, um... The only time you've ever been panhandled was actually here in Pittsburgh, where we are right now. We're driving through the strip, strip district, which is not what it sounds like. It is a paradise. You should have seen Mindy's face the first time, first I ever time you said strip, strip district. district. <laughs> she was like, where did you go? Where did you go? <laughs> it sounds it it's, sounds like the red light district. Oh, oh yes. I not. thought it was that when I first heard so that. Did I. I was and, like, mom, where did you go? Yes, what have so you I. been up to? <laughs> See, did I you get up. a new job? <laughs> oh, dude, dude. Christian. Christian <laughs> channel. I was concerned. I know. I I grew up, and in my good job, Mindy. My mom (laughs) said that we were going to the strip. That meant let's go to where all of the alcohol stores set up at the edge of Lubbock because they can set up in town. Uh, We'll go to where all the alcohol stores and the drug stores are that you know have the stuff that you're not actually legally allowed to have. So the strip district sounds like let's go to where all the beer is and all of the hard liquor. Yeah, which I don't drink. But yeah, and uh, again, another cultural difference is, you know, you come from a household with drinking Mm -hmm. and Seamus and I don't drink at all. And, you know, and it's just there's a lot of things that you don't even realize are out there that you don't realize people live differently than you think. Yeah, I think the main, it's, I... Hearing people talk about drinking like this, it's like, I think I saw mom drink wine once, and that's about it. Um, I used to have a glass of wine in the evening because it helps with my arthritis, but then it also knocked me out, and it wasn't a good way. And, and you did not drink good wine. Uh, I, well, yeah, but I don't really like... No, of course not! It tastes like vinegar! <laughs> wait, 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 I just remembered another thing. Dinosaur chicken nugget! Speaking of cultural things, oh, Pittsburgh's bus station has a really high, scary... Had you ever been in a parking garage before you came here? Yes. Yeah, you didn't do stairs, though. Yeah, I I, I knew what stairs were because we had buildings that were tall, but houses didn't usually have stairs. And if they did, it was like you went up them twice a year. We're on the second floor. So you have to go upstairs to come into our apartment. And then they live on the third floor. So they have to go upstairs to get to their room from downstairs. So then that's lots and lots of stairs. Lots and lots of stairs. Um, and we just have stairs, like, as sidewalks in some places. We do. We do. Although not as much as, like, say, Japan or Korea. No. But, yeah, we definitely, you know, no Whispers of the Heart stairs here. I don't know. That one street over by Sheets is pretty Whispers of the Heart. Yeah, but it doesn't have actual steps. Yes, it does. Where? Oh, you haven't taken the back alleys. Oh, no. No, I'm not a big The back alleys the look country. like Whispers of the Heart. It's amazing. We got up, lost once. I grew up it in was the country. country. So even living in town for me is a different cultural experience. And living down on the island, which is the bad part of our town, was horrifying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Frankly, we were really protected. God really protected us there. But as we were moving out, there was a shooting across the street. And then a guy tried to grab me and Peter fended him off. Okay, the story was was actually much simpler than that. He was hitting on her and I told him he was He being grabbed creepy. my arm and was trying to pull me away. Dude. Yeah, but I told him he was being creepy and he apologized and shook our hands. Yeah, he was he, he was, was totally drugged out of his mind. Um <laughs> but regardless, the point is that it's a very different culture just living in town and we're going up and up and up in the parking garage. I mean like, okay, I've been to San Antonio as yeah. a child, so I'm visiting family and stuff, and there are tons of parking garages in San Antonio. We only use them some times you know not sure very often but i knew about parking garages and i had been in parking garages they still creep me out i don't know no i don't like them either especially this one this one i'm on what the fifth floor now and it is all wait if we turns. leave and because we can find parking uh do we still have to pay for the ticket yep That's this is all. a state run thing dear this is how the uh, good we'll have a parking spot <laughs> <laughs> true. true um anyway so back to the whole cultural differences especially not going to school although i went to public school and i did we had one black kid we had one hawaiian girl who was polynesian 
And we had no Asian. We had one Mexican exchange student who was a lech. But that was it. We had a couple kids from Scandinavia come. As, yay, we're on the top floor. Ah, We're um, actually back outside. We're back outside. We are on floor seven. And we're back outside. And it's actually a gorgeous view. It is. All right, that's <laughs> it. Thank you. Goodbye. Dinosaur chicken nugget. Ooh, train. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was me. That was Peter. Peter. That was like a five, though. That was only a five. Dude. Wow. That was that Look, was not a very impressive I, burp. I did my best. I tried my hardest. I'd like to thank the people that got me here.